Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we're delighted to have on the show with us, Bill Franks. Bill, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks. Bill, you are walking history with so many answers to questions people want to know about. And uh, for our new Scientology listeners, I wanted them to know that you serve as Executive Director of the Church of Scientology International. How long did you serve in that post? Uh, about a year. Oh. Hubbard appointed me as his replacement in December of 1980. I assumed the post, I believe, in January of 1981. Uh, I was removed from post uh, December 27th of 1981. So during that time, you're, based, you're running the Church of Scientology International. Yes. And behind the scenes, a lot is going on with David Miscavige, uh, Author Services International. And one defining event I really wanted to, to talk to you about, a lot of people want to know about, is an event called the Mission Holders Massacre. Now, what was that event about? Well, you have to distinguish... Uh, uh, I think Hubbard wanted to get rid of the mission holders. He wanted to. I've had it. I've had some time to think about it. Well, okay, chronologically, let's start with that. I called for a mission holder meeting in November of 1980. It was to, for all mission holders in the United States and and anywhere else. Uh, it was to be at the Sand Castle at, at uh, the Flagland Base in Clearwater. I was uh, kidnapped uh, by an, and uh, sequestered, I guess would be the word, until I explained to them that there was such a thing as the Bill of Rights and threatened to go to the police, at which point they released me and returned me. I, I flew back to L.A. And we had the mission holder meeting. It was the beginning of December uh, 1981. It was basically to air all grievances and figure out what we were going to do. Uh, <clears throat> now, Bill, let me, let me interject here just because, like I said, we have a lot of new Scientology watchers who have come about because of Lee Remini's show. The mission holders, could you could you tell our audience what the mission holders were and why they no longer exist? How Hubbard created missions? Well, it started probably with uh, the FSM network and uh, it w built from there. The idea was to have missions feeding the org with uh, people. Uh, they were only allowed to deliver grades, for example, but they would send their people to the orgs for training, but they would be feeders for the org. So for, you know, for new people who were interested in Scientology, they could go to a mission. And would it be correct to say that a mission was really a franchise? Yes, that's that's what the original word was. Mission became after uh, was considered more uh, publicly acceptable for the whole religion theme. So if I were a Scientologist back in, say, 1965, I could pay a fee to the Church of Scientology of California, and then I would pay them a percentage of my earnings, and I could sell Scientology goods and services up to a certain level, after which I had to turn over the my preclears to the Scientology corporate churches or orgs. That's about right, yes. Yeah. Now, how did... How did the missions go? Were they were they prosperous and successful? Well, uh, yes. The, the, I think all of the mission holders were doing well. Their their biggest gripe was they felt the guardian's office was trying to erase them, mm. which is true. Hubbard uh, was using the guardian's office at a certain period of time. Uh, to, to do his dirty work and 
that was part of that was the biggest issue was the guardian's office. Uh, but as we'll see as we get into this, Hubbard was just using the guardian's office as sort of a foil uh, for his his paranoia. Uh, at this point, I'd like to mention if, if you remember back in where was it? In 1954, was it? Uh, I can't remember. Was it Parsons? Uh, Don Purcell. Yeah, okay. Don Purcell, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, tried to steal the his ownership. And he was extremely paranoid about this happening. And he saw the mission holders and the whole mission concept as something to worry about. Bill, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. For just a bit of history, L. Ron Hubbard started with the Dianetics Foundation prior to Scientology. And Dianetics made a lot of money the first year, and it, in, uh, uh, an early Dianeticist named Don Purcell, who was a, an oil millionaire, real estate and oil, he, he convinced Ron to bring Dianetics Foundation out to Wichita, Kansas. So you had what was called the Wichita Foundation. And I'll fill in a bit of history for listeners. Uh, the Dianetics Foundation was basically going bankrupt because L. Ron Hubbard took a lot of cash out of the organization. I'm talking about he'd go, he'd go to the bank and take out a lot of cash. And so their, their, their expenses exceeded their income. And Don wanted financial management and, and wanted to let Ron create the tech. And uh, Ron didn't like it. Um, so what happened is that Ron, without anyone on Dianetics Foundation knowing, created his own Dianetics Foundation, and he resigned as an officer of the Dianetics Foundation. Don Purcell immediately and the board put the foundation into bankruptcy. So Purcell was able to buy the book Dianetics and all of Ron's rights <laughs> at bankruptcy auction. And so L. Ron Hubbard, for a period of time, actually lost control of Dianetics, his own name. And he, you know, Don Purcell was a businessman who outplayed him. And so to your point, that made L. Ron Hubbard paranoid as hell that he had lost control of his creation and his income stream. No, and he never forgot that. No, he didn't. And, you know, he... The origins of Fair Game can arguably be, be, be traced to Don Purcell taking over... Because Hubbard stole the mailing list of the Dianetics Foundation, and he wrote letters to everyone calling Don Purcell and his colleagues liars, thieves, criminals, squirrels. So Purcell finally just gave up. Because when you've got a, a, someone like Hubbard after you and his minions, he gave up and he gave Dianetics all the rights and everything back to Hubbard and said, here, you take it. He just walked away sick of it, and by then, Hubbard had created the Church of Scientology. So really, Scientology was incorporated, I believe, December 1953, and it served as a corporate vehicle whereby Hubbard could reboot Dianetics altogether under a different name. And he got, so once he unified Dianetics and Scientology, he created the missions, but he was always afraid that they were going to take over as it as had happened with Don Purcell. Did Hubbard ever talk to you about Don Purcell, Bill? At length, uh, really? a few times when I was on the ship. Wow, what did he say? I'm really dying to know. Well, he, it was always in the context of Hubbard would talk about, I mean, this would be hours conversation. And he would he would uh, exclaim somewhere in the middle of it all that he just he needed more money, 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 money. That's why I got into this. Well, uh, John Horowitz, who was the fellow I was with at the time, I think we were kind of shocked, but he had no no bones about it that this was his motivation. This is what. Uh, and 
it scared the hell out of him. He, he would go on and, and explain what happened with Don Purcell. This can never happen again. And uh, he originally tasked uh, Mary Sue to make sure it never happened again. And that's that was the origin of the pressure that was going on the mission holder meeting uh, and their complaints because basically they were the mission holders were being demanded there was more money being demanded uh, that was one of their beasts the guardians about the guardians office and uh, they felt that they were under attack which they were now just a question Say if uh, uh, what percentage of their earnings did the mission holders have to pay to the church? Well, uh, per policy, I think I believe it was to be ten percent. So really, if I'm a Dianetics mission holder and I make a million dollars in a year, I pocket nine hundred thousand dollars gross income, and L. Ron Hubbard gets a hundred thousand. That's correct. So therefore, connecting dots of Hubbard, in, who wrote in policy, which you've read, make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make more money, unquote. If I kept 900000 as a mission holder, this would be intolerable to Mr. Hubbard. Well, Hubbard, Hubbard viewed it as, as his money. So yeah, it would be intolerable. So therefore, it became like uh, you guys are making too much money. So I have to figure out a way to basically destroy you, and that means mission holders. Like I knew Alan Walters, who was a very successful mission holder. Yes, he was. And and you know, it, Alan's success was you know Alan was kind of this larger than life bon vivant guy who who was very charismatic personality. And a lot of the mission holders were sort of that very charismatic people who, who brought a lot of people into the church. Alan Munz told me he brought 35,000 people into Scientology through the missions he owned. And that he made a fortune. Well, he did. Plus his uh, bra business, plus probably one or two other businesses. Yeah, he yeah. did very well. Yeah, and so he told me this is just for remembering Alan. Alan's told me once in a conversation, we, we talked quite a bit on the phone. Uh, he was a friend. He said he was there the night before Hubbard issued Keeping Scientology Working, the policy. And he, he, Alan told me that that was where he saw Hubbard go dark. So do you see KSW as like the forerunner of destroying the missions organization or as part of it? Uh, I couldn't really comment on that. Hmm. Well, I'm just, I, I understand. Well, I'm just do saying. I see it? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's clear as day. Uh, well, ideologically, Hubbard has to first assert his complete and total control over Scientology with keeping Scientology working. That he alone is the source. He was the one that was chosen to, or, or how it came to be that he rose above the bank. It was not it was you know off limbs for discussion. That the things groups come up with don't work. And had he allowed group input, Scientology would have been a disaster. So at least intellectually or, or ideologically, it lays the groundwork for the later takeover. Right. Well, yeah, uh, Hubbard. Hubbard's problem. One of his problems was that uh, was how to how to mask what he was really up to, uh, and he worked through other people. Mostly Mary Sue was his axe man, but he had a, he had to appear uh, the benevolent founder at all times, and that was very frustrating to him. And as we'll see later with the mission holder meeting in San Francisco where they drained all the mission holders accounts. I wasn't there, but I, that's what I've been told. Uh, he, he, uh, he finally used Miscavige and of course Miscavige was happy to do it because he was trying to get rid of everybody else. So he had a direct line to, to Hubbard. Now, when you were the executive director that 
Church of Scientology International. What was your relationship to the mission holders? Did you try to listen to them and hear their complaints out and work to solve things? Well, I had worked at, at, uh, for a long time at the LA Org, and uh, I worked with all the mission holders there. I mean, that was what I found to be successful. Uh, like Carl Barney, for example, who had four or five missions. They were all doing very, very well. Uh, and so my basic orientation to this whole thing was we want to uh, get more people into Scientology. Well, working through the missions is the way to do it. He was putting, uh, for a couple of years, uh, Diana worked under me. He put a lot of pressure on her. Uh, who is the uh, who's the fellow the name slips my mind right now who uh, developed EST a Werner Erhard okay well he was putting a lot of pressure on uh, her and he uh, Hubbard mentioned this to me he's putting a lot of pressure on uh, Diana to uh, he, he was noticing how much money Werner Erhard was making uh, and he, he was putting a lot of pressure on her to do a direct uh, bypassing the mission holders is what I'm getting at and doing mass, uh, you know, like the kind of uh, weekend deals that Bernard Earhart would apparently do. So he was modeling, he was, he was looking at the mission holders as his enemy for quite a, quite a few years. You know, that's very interesting because, um, you know, when I was a, a young man, I did ask at, out of the Newport Beach Area Center. In fact, I knew uh, Werner's brother, Nathan, is a, a gentleman, and uh, Est was very successful because it, the, the format was two, two weekends. And it was very different than Scientology. Hubbard... Uh, when he was watching television, he saw uh, Werner Earhart on, a, I think, Mike Douglas's show back then and sa and concluded, Hubbard concluded that Est was Scientology up until 1954. Werner Earhart had done Scientology. He was a grade four release, as I understand the matter. And... Um, he did take some Scientology into Est, but he also did some Zen and some other things. So Hubbard wanted to get rid of the mission holders and replace it with some sort of vehicle like S that would bring a lot of people into Scientology, is what you're saying. Yes. And it was, and it was, a, but more importantly, it was a direct cash flow. There was no 10%. There was no missions to... Uh, massage he got the cash yeah and that would be the big upside is is get rid of the people who are taking 90 per 90 cents of every dollar and just put it in his own pocket so that would be a win-win in Hubbard's world yes now but did they ever act, did did Diana Hubbard ever actually come close to creating anything akin to asked no uh no, she didn't. And I, I'm not surprised because I, I can see how within the Scientology context, it wouldn't lend itself to the freedom that Est had. Uh, for example, in Est, you could, you, in a group process, you know, you could say things that would be forbidden, that would be criminal uh, within the setting of Scientology. So that plan having failed, when was it decided I mean, L. Ron Hubbard himself is the one who, who made the decision to destroy the Mission Holders Network. Yes. But he had to hide behind his, his uh, axemen, as you call them. So David Miscavige, at this point, would he have been the action chief? Yes, that was the, that was the position that he sort of maneuvered himself into, and, and it allowed him to basically... If you talk to the people who were on the watchdog committee, you know, at international management, he got rid of all of them one by one. All of them. 
so that he had a direct line, and he did it as the action chief, uh, and he established his direct line to Hubbard. Now, what interests me, Bill, is, and I want to just do a contrast and, and pick your brain here, Pat Broker was, uh, Pat and Annie Broker were working for L. Ron Hubbard, and at that time, was it thought that Pat would be the successor of L. Ron Hubbard? <laughs> no. No? I, 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 I don't. I know Pat. Uh, I was on mission with him in Boston in '72. Uh, he didn't have that kind of ambition. It was it was Miscavige. Well, that's interesting. I'm glad that's a misconception many people have that, that somehow Hubbard wanted uh, Pat Broker as his successor. But and this is what I've always seen is Pat Broker focused on the wrong things. He focused on the ranch horses, running cash, livestock. The things that weren't important were as Miscavige fo knew what Hubbard wanted. Money. He wanted to get rid of the old Church of Scientology of California structure because that was a liability, especially after the Wollersheim case. Well, even before that, uh, he was very, you know, the 11 people that went to jail, including Mary Sue, his wife, uh, he saw that as a big liability. And jumping ahead a little bit, it was my my task, along with Miscavige, of telling Mary Sue that she either removed herself and went to jail because she was uh, resisting and coming up with more uh, appeals and whatnot. Hubbard just wanted them in jail. You know, that's uh, interesting. So... We talked about it before, how Hubbard, see, some people in the Guardian's office, some legal l lawyers felt that Mary Sue could have a case in a criminal trial, but that was just too big of a liability for Hubbard. He was he was quite nervous about being uh, somehow uh, swept into this whole thing and ending up in jail. Sure, he was an unindicted co-conspirator. Now, were you were you there? Uh, there's a story that uh, Marty Rathbun had told about David Miscavige and a, a lot of other CERG members going to Mary Sue's house and actually getting her signed documents and sign away her rights. How, how did that go down? I mean, Mary Sue didn't go gently into the good night. Did she? She put up quite a fight, didn't she? Well. I don't know about that. I wasn't part of that, but we had we had a meeting with Mary Sue at the uh, Bona Venture. Uh, it was me and David, and I believe John Nelson, uh, and we basically told her, "said so Look, you either uh, go to jail, shut your trap, or you'll be disinherited. Not only you, but." all of the three remaining kids and at that point she just capitulated right there and agreed to it so i i suspect what you're describing happened later uh by you know by getting everything signed and sealed but yeah. it was that meeting that I, I saw mary sue just uh have a breakdown it wasn't very pretty no, not at all, because Mary Sue, you could say that she was actually the co-founder of the Church of Scientology since she was there with Ron from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she had she had been his um, number one ally, really. Uh, she could moderate him, talk to him. Uh, so this is a absolutely amazing part of the Church of History that you're there in the meeting at the Bonaventure in Los Angeles. So the threat, was there also a threat that she would be disconnected from her children? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it got then, pretty dirty. This was just scorched earth on Mary Sue Hubbard. Mm -hmm. Bill, looking back, you know, Mary Sue Hubbard was very much an enforcer. She did a lot of dirty work in charge of the controller's office. Having had the years of reflection, you having known Mary Sue, What's your overall view of her as a person? Well, she was a true believer, you know, and she she did what 
Hubbard wanted, as long as I knew her. Uh, I can't say I was friends with her because we didn't get along very well, but uh, she always carried water for the for Hubbard, always, without any question. Now, when she when she resigns and, and goes to jail and she's out of the picture, does Miscavige quickly fill the power vacuum left behind by Mary Sue? Well. Uh, yes, uh, I, and this was in June of 81. Yes. I was on, uh, uh, Miscavige put me, uh, I was the lead, I was the head of the mission to remove the guardian's office. And, really? yeah, and that's what we did. We just dismantled the entire thing. Well, well how did you do it? Can we spend a few some time talk about how, how do you take apart the guardian's office once Mary Sue's gone is it a matter of declaring people SPs uh, canceling contracts disincorporation or how do you actually take it apart what are the steps well we declared all well Herbie Parkhouse went uh, uh, I was thinking who the B1 guy was uh, I can I can picture him, but I can't remember his name. Uh, but yeah, we we went right through it. They either capitulated and worked f at, at that time for me, or or they were out. And that was the case. Like Jimmy Mulligan, mm. for example, was declared. Same thing with um, his wife, who was the uh, guardian legal. And then what happened to Jane Kember? Jane Kember was removed, but she was uh, under indictment. And uh, uh, same thing, she was, the plug was pulled on her. Uh, she was what, the Guardian Worldwide? Yeah, and didn't she and, Mo, she and Mo Budlong, I believe, went to England and fought extradition to the U.S.? Well, that might have been the case. I don't know about that. But, but I know that they were removed from post immediately by myself. So by removing them from posts, those posts no longer ins exist. But the Guardian's the Guardian's office itself, was it an organization autonomous from the church, as is claimed? Under Mary Sue, uh, look, everything was under Hubbard. True. Hubbard just used them. It, corporately, probably, that's how it was set up. But uh, it was they were just a vehicle for Hubbard to use. Of course, they were the palace guard. And so when everyone's gone, the guardian's office ceases to exist. And is, is this when uh, ASI or what, what actual entity is Hubbard using then to control the church? Was RTC created at that point or was it ASI? I or? believe ASI. Uh, and RTC were uh, created probably uh, February, March of 82. They were uh, purely created by Hubbard and DM. And, and they were really a way to RTC own the intellectual property of the church. Well, yeah, look at author services, for example. They raked in so damn much money. Uh, I remember Homer Schomer, who was in <laughs> telling me just, I can't remember the numbers now, but it was large amounts of money on a weekly basis, and it all went directly to Hubbard. That's amazing. Now, author services was, David Miscavige was in charge of author services. Yes, which, which existed to take care of Hubbard's affairs. David Miscavige had to leave the Sea Org, to take a leave of absence from the Sea Org to, to run chairman of the board ASI at that time. And I guess that was just the legal via where the money, the money flowed to, and it was paid to Hubbard. Yeah, they uh, they had three attorneys. If I Heller something or other and something or other. Oh, the, the Lensk brothers. Yeah. And uh, 
There was a mission. Laurel Watson was on the mission. She was still LRHPRO. And I guess it would be February of 80. And it was called uh, MCCS uh, Mission Corporate Sword Out, I think it was. I don't know if that exactly follows my MCCS, but it was MCCS was her mission name. And they just totally rearranged everything so that Hubbard got the ultimate in protection. And I believe ASI, RTC, and now I'm just saying I believe, I don't know this for a fact, uh, were uh, created then. They weren't implemented yet, but they were created on paper. Yeah, that would have been the, uh, well, what, they, what got created was the Church of Spiritual Technology, the Religious Technology Center, and the new mother church became the Church of Scientology International. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's a picture I'm looking at here on the internet, San Francisco Hilton. <clears throat> and in the picture you see uh, Lyman Spurlock, uh, Mark Yeager, David Miscavige, Norman Starkey, Stephen Marlowe, Guillaume Lassirev, and Ray Midoff. Yes, I've seen and, the picture. Yeah, now, now they're, they're laying down the law at this point, and they're threatening the mission holders that they're going to be put in prison if they don't empty out their accounts and comply and sign all the new documents. So my question was, in the same way that the Guardian's office was dismantled, this is this is how the mission holder network was dismantled? Well, yes. Uh, yes, that's how it happened. Well, then what happens What happens to all the people that, that were in missions? Did they either, was there a schism at the time? Did a lot of people leave the church, as I understand it? Or what, what, what was the fallout in the field? Well, I, I don't really know because I wasn't in the church at that point, but... Um, oh, you, had, had you been declared? Yeah, I had been declared uh, and removed from post on the 27th of December. I think I told you that. That's when I was asked if I wanted to go to skiing on a skiing trip to the Pyrenees. Oh, yeah, it was kind of... <laughs> which which was kind of random, you know. Oh, my God. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't accept. And uh, but what precipitated was I had this mission holder meeting, and uh, I think this is what really exacerbated the whole thing. Uh, the mission, the first mission holder meeting was in December of '81, and that's what I had been kidnapped for. Uh, for and uh, eventually, I sort of shamed him into letting me run it to go back and, and have the meeting. Uh, it's really unfortunate because uh, what's unfortunate is Miscavige apparently uh, starting in 82, there were, there were, we had 10 different people uh, videoing the event. The event went on for four days. I demanded the last day for all of the WDC to come down and they did. Miscavige was scared shitless. Uh, hmm. He begged me, along with Mark Yeager, I, Mark Nager actually got on his knees and begged me to call the meeting off because they just didn't, they, they weren't used to meeting anybody. Um, and all the demands were laid out from the mission holder meeting. Now, when you were kidnapped, were you physically grabbed, tied up, and taken away? What? How did your kidnapping? I wasn't tied up, but no. I I, uh, I was isolated. I had guards on me. Um, uh, so, but, but you so, get released to go run the last day of the meeting. Well, as I said, I threatened to go to the police. Which is, according to L. Ron Harbor, a high crime, correct? Well, at that point, I just didn't give it hell, you know. No, you wouldn't, but I'm saying for, for people who are new to Scientology, uh, they're not familiar with it. As a Scientologist, you're not allowed to report or turn over another Scientologist to the police or civil authorities. Yes. That's actually in policy. And, I, Bill, the reason I want to make the point for, for new Scientology watchers is 
Scientology considers that it is above the law, and it's, it, it is its own law. Therefore, you can be declared if you, and Hubbard put this in writing, turning over the person of another Scientologist to the police or, or, or civil authorities. So, yeah, I imagine that you saying, I'm going to call the police if you don't let me go, impacts them like we don't have control of Bill Franks anymore. Yes, well, uh, I just might add, it also shows you my desperation. I, I never would have ever thought of doing that, uh, but I, I wasn't going to be locked up. Oh, hell no. Hell no, you're very much your own man. And so, so the mission holders, you know, you, you go on Google, people can go on Google and read about the mission holders basically turn over their bank accounts. And in many cases, they turn over their the deeds to their property. They actually own their own buildings. And Scientology... Yes, that, that happened to uh, uh, Ben Corridan. He had to turn over this historic building down in Riverside, California. He eventually got it back thanks to uh, <laughs> some collaboration from me. But yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened. And yeah, and that's a great that's a great story that uh, Ben was one of the few people who actually deposed Miscavige, and thanks to your help and and, and, and others and, and Ben's persistence, he did get his building back. But to just show that that all these people who contribute to Scientology, who were true believers who wanted to build it, Hubbard could destroy them out of sheer caprice and greed. They meant nothing to him. And and including you, you who who have been so we were all uh, expendable, yes. Yeah, and Hubbard's and Hubbard's. How did Hubbard look at people? Were they just, they just unit units of production? I mean, did he have? Could he have friends? Well, if he did, I don't know of any. Uh, he was he was. Uh, well, in his own words, I'm in it for the money. And uh, that that statement was made to me and it was right before uh, the birthday game came out what in 74 around there and you know bill for for hubbard to say i'm only in it for the money corroborates what many have said is l ron hubbard told his old um, science fiction writing pals if you want to get rich the way to do it's not a penny a word but start your own religion and he tells Helen O'Brien, his secretary, we have to look into the religion angle. Switching gears, when Mary Sue Hubbard was, when she was sent off to prison, and Miss Gavage steps in to kind of fill the power vacuum, do you think Mary Sue Hubbard had a good influence on L. Ron Hubbard or made him worse? I mean, what, what changes does Hubbard have with Mary Sue out of the way? not running the Guardian's office, does he become even more unrestrained, unhinged? He, he, I believe he viewed it as removing impediments to him just grabbing money. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds uh, incredible. I mean, from the perspective of a true believer, but he told me in three separate occasions what I, what I said about money and how money and power is really what he wanted uh, and everything else was just a waste of time. But uh, I remember David Mayo saying the same thing. Uh, in fact, it's in writing somewhere where you know David's recollections of uh, Hubbard and Hubbard's view on money. So it was just... A, towards the end of his life all he wanted to do was get more money which I think he passed passed on to Miscavige uh, uh, from uh, he doesn't Miscavige doesn't have any clue I wouldn't say he has a, a clue as to what the the virtues of Scientology 
proclaimed, even though it turned out to be all BS. Uh, he's just, he's in it, for, you know, he was almost like, a, how I came to view it, it's like he's almost like the perfect uh, successor. And that's that's extremely revealing. He has the same will to power, the same immorality, the same greed, the lust for money. And he's willing to destroy people. Yeah. Now, we know that before, we know that Hubbard, uh, well, well, let's hold that for a minute. When the missions, when the missions were gone, did Scientologists in the field, as I understand, they basically were told, "Get this is the new program, get with it. And that there were a lot of declares in that period, but, but generally people who wanted Scientology began to go to the class five orgs or other orgs. And so I guess there's some kind of period where it's sort of turbulent, but then it's explained that there's this new corporate creation that will protect the church. Uh, even better in that the rogues and the guardian's office are gone mm -hmm. and the mission holders were viewed as criminals who had to be purged just like the guardian's office <clears throat> so there's a kind of a rewriting of history during this period F from from what i from my study of it and i um <clears throat> bill i i wanted to do some scientology in this period through a client and there was still a lot of enormous paranoia that had come in the aftermath of the mission holder massacre which is why my first introduction to Scientology was the uh, doing the Oxford capacity analysis their so-called scientific personality test <laughs> which ha which has nothing to do with Oxford University yeah. which has nothing to do with personality analysis or anything it's uh, just a manipulative tool but I remember I had a, a long and extensive sec check and they were very concerned about if I had been sent in. And that really st stuck me as a, you know, new to Scientology, like who thinks like that? Have I been, am I a member of the press? Am I a member of a law enforcement? Have I been sent in by law enforcement? The language is so unusual because in my life, no one had ever addressed me like that. Have you been sent in for the purposes of destroying Scientology organizations? The, the, the question is so weird for a new person. It must be a real shock for a new guy. Well, well you, to use a Scientology term, you can't think with it. Like, no, who the, you know, here I'm a, I'm a young guy in my 20s. I haven't, I'm curious about past lives. I'm not, I haven't been sent in by anybody. And, even it, had I been sent, and I didn't know enough about Scientology to know even what to look for, assuming I had been sent in, which I hadn't been sent in. So it develops this thing in your head about, these guys are really weird, weird people. This is not like a church. And um, so, so the Mission Holder Massacre is a, a turning point in the church where then Hubbard basically is free to run the entire thing while pretending he has nothing to do with running the church. Yes. Bill, when you, um, when you, when you were executive director, you still believed you, you could, you could run the church, that it could, it could do something. Did you ever have any, any premonition or feelings or intuitions that the mission holder network would be destroyed did you see that coming or was it a surprise well no um, my eyes started awaking awaken uh, when Mayo and I this would be in August of 74 I've mentioned this in other podcasts uh, where Hubbard basically confided in writing but then the dispatch was to be destroyed immediately, uh, that there is no Ode Overts and withholds, that it's all just, it's his method of controlling people. Those are his words. Really, could you say that again? 
that there is no overts and withholds. The context was that I was the director of training on FLAG. Uh, Mayo, of course, was the senior CS. And we were trying, to, we had a blown student. We were in, I believe, in Morocco at the time. And a student blowing without a passport is, you know, it's pretty significant. We got him back and then we lost him. And we were trying to show that Hubbard, we were trying to show Hubbard, demonstrate to Hubbard that we had followed the technology 100%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we waited and we waited and we waited this particular night. We had sent all the folders up to his office. Uh, it was like 3.30 in the morning and we got this uh, dispatch. Clara Popham was the messenger and how, what I just said is exactly what he said. Uh, it, it was just a shock and you can imagine how David the senior CS, uh, you know, overts and withholds are a large part of the technology, at least at that time. Sure. Uh, and it's called o OWs, and it's still a big part of the technology, right up your OWs, your overts and withholds. But Hubbard's saying it's just a control mechanism. Yeah, it's a complete bullshit. It's, he's, he just said, this is how I control people. And he, he swore us the secrecy, and he said, if you... Uh, ever release this information, I'll lose all control of Scientology. That's just absolutely stunning revelation, Bill. It, it, it's historical because if you think about it, writing up your, your overs and withholds, it, it's, it's a way to control somebody, but it interiorizes them. It crushes them down because it makes them think they're doing something wrong. Yes. They're criminals. They're just really pieces of garbage you are out to destroy something that it's Orwellian at best and oh, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling and um, you're an educated gentleman Bill you, you and a question that people get asked that are that I'm asked is how can smart people fall for Scientology and, and I said there's no one way to answer it you first of all they don't know what they're getting themselves into because there's no disclosure but when you're a doctrinaire Scientologist when you hear that, that OWs is Hubbard's way of controlling people, it must have hit you like a ton of bricks. Well, you know, David Mayo had a scholarship to Oxford or Cambridge, his choice. He chose Scientology. This is when he graduated from high school. He, he, we both, we never talked about this again between the two of us. Uh, until uh, we met again, I think in '84, <laughs> and never we just didn't talk about it. And I don't know, I can't speak for David, but I know for myself, from that point on, I started, I started viewing Scientology as what can I uh, preserve, what what's worth preserving, hmm. uh, and that's how I viewed it. I, uh, well, yeah, you, it, it, it would force you to start reducing down to what what is worth preserving. If, if this part is a lie, is there really anything? What's left? What, what can I preserve? And that would be a, a terrible burden to carry around, especially when you're you're up at the top, you know, near the very top of the organization. Because you, did you have to carry it around like a terrible secret and a burden? Did it keep you awake at night? Well, yeah, it was a real emptiness, and I, um, yeah, yes, the answer to your question is yes. It'd be, yeah, because it would be a betrayal, a fundamental betrayal of what you'd committed your own life to, your life essence, your life force, the very substance of your life. When you When you feel betrayed, this is part of what makes some forms of what you think are spirituality so devastating when you find out it's fraudulent that it's really an organization out to manipulate people and what you were, were really believing is not true there's a fundamental betrayal and a sense of loss 
Yeah, what I learned from it is you got to watch out for ideologies because ideologies, you, you, ideologies are sort of a shortcut through life, so you don't have to think. Uh, so, and it's it's my thinking was more like what can I preserve rather than this is just baloney. I mean, what we found out that night should have been enough to just yeah in in the church right then and there yeah and, and to your point about ideologies and in, in, in my my work i call them religions ideologies plug and play identity systems in other words for for people who who, who don't think this is a plug and play identity system it tells you who you are what the purpose of life is what happens after you die, what you should do now, what you should obey, what you should not do, what you should do. It, it, it simplifies things. So for the search for truth ends and the defense of an identity begins when you adopt an ideology or religious system because you identify with it. And when that becomes your essence and substance, it's easy to radicalize people. It's easy to get them to lie, to harm others, to cheat, and to do things that, that they otherwise would not do, but they have so identified with it. And I know that, that in the modern church under Miscavige, and this is very important, is the identity is enforced. It becomes, must be a Scientologist in good standing, must increase my IAS patron statuses. And I look at, it's such a falsification of, of what a true, authentic, existential investigation into the nature of existence itself would be. Because a, an authentic and profound confrontation with the, exis the existential nature of life is not about getting these glorified bowling trophies and giving money to an organization. In fact, that has nothing to do with an, uh, an inquiry into truth for the nature of reality. And uh, and yet in Scientology, you can believe that that's, you're actually, Hubbard said that this is actually the living lightning of life. You know, he was a very skilled writer in the way he could manipulate phrases like that. Yes, and very profound. He, he liked to be considered very profound. Yeah, he did. He was the, uh, that's why he called himself source, which is a big deal. Quite, quite a big ambitious term. Well, Bill, this is, a, this is very fascinating. I'd like to do another one where we go into some more of the details and nuances of everyday life in Scientology, you know, and talk about what goes on in terms of how they indoctrinate people, you know, what goes on, and get more of, of your life story in our next interview. All right. Well, this is probably a good time for me to end off, too. Yeah, likewise. And thank you so much, Bill Franks, for being on the show for okay. Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you, Bill Franks. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.